Hey folks, um, I'm Anatoly. I am uh, one of the Solana co-founders and the CEO, current CEO. <laughs> um, so we are high performance blockchain and we're so fast that we had to use a different virtual machine than everyone else. And the virtual machine we picked is the Berkeley packet filter. Um, so if you guys have never heard of Berkeley packet filter, um, it's a limited bytecode created in 92. The original definition called is now called classic BPF, uh, a fine vintage. Um, it's created for user-injected fast in-kernel network packet filtering. So imagine you have code in user space, untrusted code, and it wants to process packets deep in the network stack in the kernel, and it compiles a module in user space, it takes this bytecode, sends it into ring zero, and that code runs inside the kernel without memory protection. So this is code designed for running in a hyper-secure environment, and it's designed for building modules in this unsecure environment, user space. So around when it was first created, um, it only had two registers, so it was a two-register-based VM. Um, in 2013, people realized that they needed more registers, um, so they added a bunch of support for 64-bit registers um, and some tail calls and some kind of fancier features that you're used to more today. So these days, it's available in uh, your, you know, your Linux kernel you can download from the internet. Basically, every Linux distribution, uh, I think, has BPF enabled these days. And um, the back end has been mainlined into LLVM um, a few years ago. And LLVM, if you guys don't know, is the compiler tool chain that's, um, I think, used by Rust. And there's no other implementation for Rust, as far as I know. But it's used by like just about every major um, hardware company to build out their tooling. So what's the current architecture of uh, BPF? Um, it's got 64-bit virtual instructions, um, supports a variety of typical operations. Your favorites, add, sub, mul, div, but not signed division. So no signed division instruction. Um, it can do byte swaps from big endian to little endian. It has a memory, read, and store. And it can do branches, so very exciting. Uh, and all kinds of branches, uh, direct, PC relative, and conditional. Um, and its instruction encoding basically looks like x86. And the reason for this is because when you're in the kernel, you don't want to do a lot of processing, so you just basically, your JIT is take this instruction and map it directly to x86, one-to-one -one mapping. So in a single pass, the Linux kernel does verification and JIT all at once. So these days, BPF has a whole 11 64-bit registers and 32-bit sub-registers. Um, forget the total number of the sub-registers, but I think it's around 30. It's got a program counter, which you can use to count instructions. So this is how we measure how much uh, effectively gas a program is using. It's got R0 um, return value right from function calls. And it has R1 through R5, which, in, which can hold your um, arguments to your function calls. And these are the exact same registers that x86, um, x64 uses, uh, and a bunch of other, uh, probably RISC as well. The nervous guys can, can probably tell me. But I'm pretty sure RISC also uses R1 through R5 for uh, arguments to function calls. And uh, R6 to R9 are caller, callee saved registers that are preserved across function calls. So this is kind of where you can you know, hoist whatever pointers you want. Um, and R10 is a read-only stack frame pointer. So notice no, no actual stack pointer. Um, these uh, registers map nice, nicely to x86 and also are designed to map to a bunch of architectures. So if you guys are getting the idea, people design this bytecode to basically be kind of a, an intersection of common architectures that Linux runs on. Uh, and it's got a really weird stack. So R10 contains the stack frame pointer, but not the stack pointer. So it's used as a base reference to locations in the current frame. You know, like typically when you execute code, you know, like your typical register VM, it's got a stack pointer, 
And every time you add stuff to the stack, you increment the stack pointer. Every time you remove stuff from the stack, you decrement the stack pointer. None of that happens here. You just have a pointer to a stack frame. Every function has its own preallocated stack frame. So you have to spill arguments that you want on the stack into that function. Um, and it has a fixed size number of frames and thus fixed call depth. So you can only execute code to a particular depth. So you kind of recursion limited. So BPF on Linux must be verified before the kernel will accept it. It's got guaranteed termination. The Linux verifier will uh, prevent you from doing jumps that can jump backwards, that it can't detect it will, will terminate. Um, it does a bunch of memory access checks and checks that all the paths have safe execution and uh, has a bunch of restrictive function calls. But um, really, there's almost no function calls because you have a single object file with no relocation, no data sections. Um, and very limited built-in function support. So you basically compile this blob into a single object file, you send it to the kernel. This assembly kind of looks like x86, but really like what, what this is missing is like when you have a, a real x86 program with a big pile of dependencies and shared objects, there's a, a bunch of you know, dynamic jumps to everywhere. Like none of that stuff occurs in, in BPF modules in the kernel. It's really just kind of the meat of the program, you know? So using BPF outside of the Linux kernel is fairly uncommon. Um, we're maybe the biggest user of this. There's a project called Celium that builds a virtual network stack. Um, but really, they're still designing their BPFs to run inside the Linux kernel. But they, do, they have much more sophisticated tooling, C, C++ tool chain. Um, but they're still compiling BPF targeting Linux. So, we were crazy enough to think that, why don't we take this awesome bytecode that a lot of people have spent decades working on making it secure and fast and use it as our bytecode for our smart contracts language. Um, so that took a lot of work. So we modified the LLVM tool chain to get multi-file linking, you know, multiple files, you put them together, that, that, that was missing. Um, we can do load time relocation, so code doesn't have to be loaded in the exact same address space that it was compiled into. Um, we, we added some read-only data segments, right, that was missing, like just plain reading strings in a program, stuff like that, and uh, PC relative jumps. Um, do you guys know what PC relative jumps are? It's basically you can, uh, when you're running through the instruction set, you can start jumping to things that are offset from the current instruction counter versus from um, a static address that's built in. And that means if you have this capability, you can take this code and load it into any address space you want, like in, in, uh, in any offset. The reason why you want to do this is because when you execute a smart contract, you may want to load them in whatever address space you have available to you versus the one it was compiled for. Right? So we have a, there's, there was an awesome um, port of the BPF compiler, or not compiler, VM in Rust. And based on that, um, we basically took that, took that code, added the features that we added to LVM, and uh, added, it already had support for JIX x86, which was kind of busted, but we made that work. Um, and our goal is to actually take Berkeley Packet Filter and compile it down to uh, bytecode that execute on GPUs like Spear 5. So why would we be doing this? From our perspective, what does a smart contract do typically, right? sees a little bit of data, maybe does a cryptographic operation, does a tiny bit of logic, one or two branches, and does a state update. So this is the kind of contract, you know, like imagine what is a decentralized exchange doing on a, on a blockchain, right? Just comparing a couple prices, does a tiny bit of logic, then stuffs the, the result of what that logic does into some state. This tiny bit of kernel, right, can be compiled to a bytecode that can execute on a stackless instruction set, such as a GPU. So you take this kernel and you load all the transactions you want across all the SIMD lanes in your GPU, about 4,000 of them, and you execute all of them in parallel. So that is the cheapest possible way you can execute code right now, today, 
out, outside of like TPUs for uh, deep learning that Google is building, GPUs are the cheapest per dollar thing we have available to us. Could you, so you were talking about a specific oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, so this is great, first of all. This is really, I mean, we've talked before. Yeah. Super impressed with the project. Uh, but it, it seems to me like there's a context here in which merits these super fast and secure smart contracts that, because uh, GPU uh, computations are very fast for when you have like load a lot of data, because you know, getting into memory takes a long time. Yeah. Once it's in memory, it's very fast versus sort of like a multi-context computation would probably be slow. So somehow in here, you seem to be hinting at that you have a, a particular context of smart contracts that yeah. is meriting, one, these low-level batch memory computations, um, which might be different than, than, than other VMs. Could you tell us a little bit uh, about that, just to keep yeah, us Yeah, 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 totally. So that's, that's a really fair point. So GPUs require a lot of computation. They need to know ahead of time what the data dependencies are. And you take an enormous batch of these things and you load them. You have to transfer it from main memory to GPU memory. Then you tell the GPU, here's the kernel you want to execute, and then it runs across a big pile of memory. Um, that, that's actually like quite an expensive operation, hundreds of milliseconds. Um, the reason we can do this is because we have a very simple transaction format and state machine where the transactions specify the state that they're going to read and state they're going to write. So basically, a transaction is a vector. These, this is the state I want to read. This is the state I want to write. And those addresses are public keys, effectively. Right? They're just. Does that make sense? So are you essentially like low, like your mempool is then going to a GPU to create a block, and you're performing these vector operations for block creation? Yeah. So when when a, when the, cool. when the block producer sees a big pile of transactions, they sort them all, find all the non-overlapping ones, dump them to the GPU, gets executed. So GPU kernel execution, that that's not even started yet. That's just still like a dream. Um, what does what does work and is super effective is doing all the signature verification on GPUs. So, yep. Okay. But. Okay, uh, you, you, you just mentioned the signature verification. I mean, uh, when you mentioned like a simple contract in a batch in GPU, like uh, DEX and something like this, uh, like how does it compare to signature verification, which is like, I think, is like much more. Uh, Oh, signature verification, like the, the reason why it works so well is because it's a bunch of 256 bit math, right? Yes. And there's no branching. So all the, basically every ah. kernel will take the same exact path. Yeah, yeah. Right? I so, mean, you, you will upload this to GPU too. Yeah. And, okay. yeah. So that part was super easy. We got that working right away. It has nothing to do with BPF. Uh, the reason we picked BPF is because, so my background, I spent most of my career at Qualcomm working on mo like mobile operating systems. We're quite familiar with the, with those tools. Um, and typically, you take BPF and you run it on the, these DSP processors. So there's network switches you can buy today. Um, some just have FPGAs in them, but some have BPF that they can basically execute directly. Um, and I think in the next slide, I can show you why. So why BPF and not Wasm? One, it's safe. It's been in the Linux kernel forever, um, and it's fast. So with uh, BPF hardware offload, um, you can get a single node computer, right? Single system can ingress 40 gigabits worth of data and process 60 million packets per second. That means it's looking at the data, does introspection, just, and makes a decision, do I drop or let this packet go through? Or change maybe where it's going. Um, that's 60 million things per second. Um, without hardware offload, it's 40 million things per second. Still remarkably fast. Um, so from our perspective, right, if we have this parallel system, why don't we use as much bandwidth as, as we can? So 40 gigabit networks, which are available everywhere, like in every co-location spot in the world, um, why don't we have uh, blockchains that can do 60 million transactions per second? Um, so why not BPF? And it's because um, it's really, 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 really freaking hard to work with. <laughs> um, so there's like like three people in the LVM 
like you know mailing list to work in BPF, and we ask him a question, their answer is, "Why are you doing this?" <laughs> um, uh, so Rust uh, uses LVM for its, for its backend. So wouldn't it just be easy to swap that in and make it work? Um, no. So Rust transparently often requires things like memory allocation, system dependencies, threads, um, create dependencies, pull a whole bunch of other weird things. Um, none of those things are available. So there's no S, no STD lib, right? You have to compile everything with, with no STD. It's single threaded only. There's no threads, right? There's no BPF system calls to go create me a thread. Um, there's no networking. There's no standard AO. None of this stuff exists. You really shouldn't need this in a smart contracts language, but the problem is if you're using Rust, you want to use Cargo. When you use Cargo, you pull a dependency that does a, even if you don't call that execution path directly, it depends on you know a big pile of threaded code. Um, and that makes it impossible to compile. So we uh, had to build a big pile of this custom tooling. Um, the Rust, Sysroot, and SIMD, um, all these libs re re required modifications. We have a fork of the Rust tool chain, fork of the LVM tool chain. Um, we had to remove 128-bit support. Um, so I just, you know, yeah, <laughs> uh, we're masochists. Um, uh, but what's awesome, Rust has this fantastic cross-compiler called Zargo. Car well, how do you guys call it? Um, that means that as soon as we added this backend, even with all these restrictions like NoSTD, there's still a big pile of crates available. And now all of a sudden, we have basically Cargo build, compiles a contract, and we can deploy it on chain. And we can execute it with the same safety guarantees that the Linux kernel uses to execute untrusted code. Um, and that's pre pretty freaking awesome. Um, so actually, this is a bit out of date. We fixed a bunch of this stuff. Uh, we added an allocator. We didn't add 128-bit support. Uh, Panic is working pretty well. Um, there's still a bunch of testing. Every once in a while, we compile a contract that LVM just generates junk. Um, if you guys ever worked in LVM, it is like a, a horrendous mess of C++ with like all sorts of like just gnarly hacks all over the place. I don't, I don't understand why compilers are written by the worst software engineers. <laughs> Sorry. Rust, the Rust toolchain is actually way better. Uh, but man, LVM. <laughs> um, so you guys should try it out. You can go clone it from our website. Uh, it's a work in progress. So if you guys compile a program that blows up or does something unexpected, it'd be awesome for you guys to submit that issue. Um, but you can uh, take Rust and compile it to BPF. And uh, there's a VM for you to execute it on, on a network that generates blocks every 400 milliseconds and can process 50,000 transactions per second. Any questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm still wondering, maybe I'm naive, but uh, I would guess uh, that uh, the main bottleneck of blockchain is like consensus, signature verification, then I.O. Like how important is actually making uh, VM faster? Yeah, we solved all those problems. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the VM is actually like a substantial amount of execution Yeah, time. We, we just ported the move language kind of as a marketing stunt. Um, and their interpreter is 700 times slower than uh, like r running native Rust. Um, so we can get about 4,000 TPS with uh, the move VM um, because each instruction takes 700 microseconds. Um, native Rust one takes about one microsecond, so we could see about 50,000 TPS there. OK, thanks. Sorry, I, I don't think you answered his questions. Oh. If, if you look at like the transaction throughput yeah. of a blockchain network, yeah. you have you know plo uh, block production. You have actually taking a block and sending it to a number of nodes necessary to get votes. You have yeah. signature aggregation. So, uh, so all I mean, these like, things. And you, so I guess the thesis of your work is that uh, the, the dominant performance characteristic is actually in the smart contract execution. Or maybe that's the thesis of this talk, but maybe yeah. there's more to it than that. And yeah, so, to, so to get here, um, so our secret sauce, it's all open source, Apache 2.0, so steal it and use it. It'll be your problem. Is uh, We use a verifiable delay function to introduce a source of time before consensus. So once you have a source of time, like all the stuff that cellular networks do to make it possible for billions of people to talk to each other becomes available in the distributed system. Um, and we have a very, very kind of rudimentary 
uh, deterministic but random round robin that we use called very similar to time division multiple access. So what I hear from what you're saying is that there is no delay for block propagation in the network. No, there is delay. Because they know before they could send the blocks to the nodes before they need them. No, there's, there's, there's delay in block propagation, but the finality for the blocks is asynchronous. So, yeah, you want me to do the other slides? Sure. All right, sweet. Um, two talks. Do you know where they are? Um, so here's like the there's like a bunch of Pareto, like there's a bunch of choices you can make when building a blockchain. If you use asynchronous consensus, right, that's uh, potentially um, easier to attack with a dynamic adversary because that adversary can examine more of the state, right, and then can make choices that disrupt the rest of the network. But it's faster. It's strictly faster than synchronous consensus. So our, our whole thesis is like, why don't we build the fastest thing possible, and then they'll have the lowest price, and then people that want to use that and take those safety you know, trade-offs can do this. Right. And then, sorry, sorry, I'm not start, trying to harp on the point. I'm, yeah. I'm just saying that like, the, the number of transactions needs to get sent to a number of nodes. Yep. Having a custom VN with oh, token okay. so, does oh, not how, make that How sense. does the data propagate? Exactly. Um, so it's, it's bound by the bandwidth of the s slowest node in the supermajority. OK, so if you have a one gigabit network, everyone's on a one gigabit network, you can propagate data at one gigabit to everybody else, right? Because you can take, it, take you know, let's say I have 120 megabytes. I split it up into you know, 64 kilobyte packets. I transmit 2,000 of them right, to every peer. They, in parallel, transmit them to everyone else. So everyone's transmitting 2,000 packets at once, right? And we throw some erasure codes in there, and whatever gets dropped gets reassembled. Well, there's, a, there's a time dependency there, because not everyone has it at the same time. There's like a that, propagation that, that's, why, that's why finality is asynchronous, right? So propagation occurs first. Whoever catches it last, they do the state transition later. Then they decide to vote. That vote gets thrown back into the mix, right? That's why you need asynchronous consensus, because if we all had to synchronize, then we couldn't do that. And that means there's a safety trade-off. So any blockchain that has asynchronous consensus has some safety trade-offs from a, a fully synchronous one. And uh, OK. So do, I'll, I'll try to, do you guys want me to do this talk or no? OK, OK, two talks, sweet. Um, so yeah, current challenges in blockchain, consensus is low, latency is high, throughput is low. Um, so VDFs are um, this really cool thing that's kind of been recently discovered. In 2017, when this big ICO boom was happening, I thought I could get rich, but I had too much coffee one night. I was up till 4 in the morning. And I had re this realization that um, you can loop SHA-256. You know, its output is the next input. And you can build this recursive you know, hash function. And that proves that you're spending time somewhere in some real core. Like, you know, single core, single thread is running somewhere for some, some amount of time. Um, so if you sample this process, you can generate a data structure that represents time passing. And you can verify it on separate SIMD lanes between every sample. So modern day $700 GPU card has four, uh, roughly 4,000 SIMD lanes. So one second can be verified in a quarter millisecond. So that's the asymmetric speed up. Um, when I talked to Dan Bonet, he said, this is not a VDF, it's garbage. Um, he didn't say the garbage part, but he said, please call it a, a, a hash chain delay function instead. Because VDFs have this um, property of being polylog verified. That means that you spend time generating it, and then you run some verification function that takes much faster to verify, uh, faster than um, this basically equivalent amount of compute. Um, right, 4,000 times 4,000 slices is equal to one, right? Make sense? Yeah. But it works. Um, and you can do use it today. You don't have to wait for uh, hardware from VDF Research, even though those guys are building some really ridiculously awesome stuff. Um, so imagine I took a photo with the New York Times, right? That means I existed after the New York Times was published. And then it, somebody published that photo in the next New York Times. It means I existed before that publication occurred. So now there's an upper and lower bound of me being alive. 
So you can do the same thing with this process. So somebody's generating this chat to 56. I use it in a transaction. Basically, I sign that value. And then that person takes a big pile of transactions and hashes them back into this process. So that, 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 um, uh, that operation of appending it to the state and then hashing it again modifies this process in this unpredictable way because it's pre-image resistant hash function. So that you can record that state basically in your data structure, say that account, you know, 50 million, blah, blah, blah. I added this hash into the mix. And that guarantees that everything that was, you know, has a Merkle path to that hash was created before that modification occurred. So now I have an upper and lower bound of time when any of these events occurred. So this is kind of the crux of the whole thing. Imagine you're in an island somewhere, you know, blockchain water world. A bottle floats by. You open the bottle, there's a thumb drive in it. You plug it in. You, you look at this data, and there's a big pile of hashes. And you basically verify it, and you look at the last 10 minutes of it. And you look at the transactions, and inside those transactions, you see votes. And you compute that the, based on some prior state, these votes represent a supermajority of the network. And they all voted for this particular history. And you decide, hey, I think this is good enough. You sign the last bit of hash. You create your vote. You add it into the thumb drive, and you throw it over for somebody to linearize. That's it. So this is like a totally asynchronous operation, and you are not relying on any direct peer-to-peer -peer messages from anyone else. Go ahead. How are you counting nodes in the network? Uh, you just look at the votes, some stake-weighted approach. Go to the vote slide. Yeah, is there a vote slide? Um, yeah, so basically, you look at this historical log, and the last 10 minutes of it represent some actors, some stake-weighted way you want to do this. And you decide that in the last 10 minutes, three of the four that you care about voted. So you decide, OK, I think this network is actually all connected. There's enough people voting on this thing. I'm going to throw my vote in the mix. So you can kind of build your own protocol on top of this. But this is really the, the basic building block, is that I look at this data structure. I don't have to talk to anyone directly because I can infer from the data itself the delta in time between all the votes. So I know that looking at this data, kind of in the point of reference, as this data represents from the last bit, Charlie voted about you know, seven minutes ago. So what's cool is I don't really care about real-time clocks, because the vote that I sign is only valid from that little point. Right? It's just in this world where this is the real time, it doesn't matter if the clocks get all different, right? if, if like the CPU speeds are different between each node. All I care about is that as this data is represented to me, I can make a, a vote from the point of view of this data structure directly. And it's only valid in that, you know, in that representation. And it's close enough to the real thing because Intel has SHA-256 specific instructions, which do one round of SHA-256 in 1.75 cycles. And it'll probably take $100 million for somebody to get more than 30% better than that. My guesstimate. That's basically it. Um, cool. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, like, we've been, like, we had this, like, really, really stupid idea of um, building deep learning hardware and mining to offset the cost of the hardware and then, then undercutting, like, deep learning prices. I'm sure there's, like, 50 startups pitching this. Um, and, like, we were kind of playing around with this uh, and just talking about, like, hey, proof of work sucks. Is there any alternative? But it's really nice because it's based on a physical constant. Um, what's another physical constant that, that exists in the world? That's time. Problem is time is not like a, like a, a thing. Like it has no weight. It's one dimensional. Um, so you can't really use it for civil resistance. You can't just say, like, my vote is you know, larger because I spend 10 minutes longer because I could you know, make a bunch of civil cores and run them all day long, right? So that, that was like kind of the start of it. Um, then I had too much coffee. It was up till 4 AM. And I realized that you can reference the hashes. And then you can also update the state in such a way that's unpredictable and get this relative difference in time between events. And that was really all, all I had. Um, 
And it took about a month for me to convince my wife that I had something interesting. Uh, <laughs> and once she said, okay, this isn't bullshit, that was like, oh man, I'm really going to have to quit and do this whole thing. Um, that was it. Thank you.